Hi, this is a quick video on how to keep a notebook either for a research project when you get to that point or a lab notebook for a class. So let's talk about the goals before we get into the nitty gritty. First of all, uh, your notebook should be set up in such a way that it could be an acceptable legal document. And I know that this seems like a bit of overkill for a notebook that you're using for, let's say, Gen Chem Lab. But what we're trying to do here is not just have you do experiments, we're trying to teach you skills, and keeping a good notebook is a skill that employers want. And at some point, when you're employed in a lab situation, your lab notebook will be a legal document. It could be used as evidence for patents or things like that. So you should always treat your lab notebook carefully. And what you're going to put in there is basically proof of what you did and how you did it. And this is really important that you want to put what you actually did. Now, there are times when you will mess up and people's instinct is, oh no, I want my lab notebook to look perfect. It's never going to look perfect. It's always going to be a bit messy. That's okay. We kind of expect that. And so we always like cross out mistakes in a way that you can still read what's underneath. That's part of being an acceptable legal document. Like you're actually documenting the errors that you made as well. This is really a record for posterity. That sounds really grandiose. Normally when I say record for posterity, like it would be like my journals that I'm leaving to my kids but there actually is like this whole idea of academic families. So if you look at my background, you could say I have a science family tree. The picture in the middle of this is my PhD advisor, Tina Volker. So she is my academic parent. Um, and in addition to producing me as a PhD student, she's produced a whole bunch of other PhD students. I've put only two of those here, Andy Vermillier, who's kind of important for the story I'm going to tell. He's the one who graduated right before me. And then Ryan Marcico, who was my lab mate and is the PhD student of Tina's that I know the best. The way I do science has been heavily influenced by the person that I worked for. So that's why we call it a family tree. And of course, Dr. Volker's science was heavily influenced by the person she trained under, which in this case was Dr. Barbara Sulzberger. And we could go back. Some people have traced their family trees back to like really famous people like the Curies and stuff. I don't have anyone really exciting in my science family tree. So the reason I say this is a record for posterity is because if you don't keep good records, that could be hard for people who come after you. When I started in the Volker lab, I met Andy Vermillier, I think a couple weeks before he defended his dissertation and left for a job. So there wasn't really a lot of overlap between us. And then I was expected to take the method that he had developed and use it for my project, which was a little difficult because there was the basics written down, but not the nitty gritty details. So there were some, some little things where it's just like you had to know exactly how to do it, but no one had ever written down exactly how to do it. And so there was a lot of trial and error and frustration as I, and then later also Ryan, you know, we, we just had to figure it out all over again. So when I say a record for posterity, I really mean for all the people who are coming after you who are doing the same sort of stuff. And again, this sounds like a grandiose thing to say, if you are taking a Gen Chem class and you're like, well, no one's going to do what I did before. No one's going to look at my lab notebook. That's right. And at the same time, you're developing good habits. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get you in good habits so that when you get into a research lab, which hopefully you will later in your academic career, you will keep a really good lab notebook for yourself and for the people who come after you. Okay. So again, you're showing proof of what you did and how you did it and you're leaving a record for posterity, how can you do this? First of all, I will say people argue over whether or not you need a table of contents. 
I do think that is super handy. I know that I was a little bit lax about putting in a table of contents when I started grad school. And then as I got later on and I had, you know, years worth of experiments to look back through, I'm like, I know I did that somewhere. Where is it? Which of my lab notebooks is it in? And I would just spend like half an hour looking through over and over again until I found the right experiment. So having a table of contents in your lab book is great. Your lab notebooks should contain all of your data. And I have a couple of things to say about this. First of all, I need to point out that any observation you make is data. So normally when I say put in all your data, people are like, okay, I'm gonna write down the numbers. I'm gonna weigh this. I'm gonna put the numbers in my lab notebook. I'm gonna measure this. I'm gonna put my measurement to the lab notebook. But there are all sorts of things which are not numbers, which are also very important observations. I'll give you an example of that pretty soon when I show you a sample lab notebook. The other thing I want to say about this is that sometimes you will get data that is a printout. Let's say you're using some sort of instrumentation and that's gonna give you a computer output, like a graph or something like that. Great, print it out and then put that printout in your lab notebook. Yes, you could save it to the computer, but a lot of times as you're going through and you're trying to compile all your data and analyze it like it is so helpful to have it all in one place so you're not saying oh where did i put that where did i put that where did i put that put your printouts in your lab notebook another thing you should be careful to do is write the actual procedure that you followed as you did your experiment and by actual procedure i mean what you actually did not what you planned to do normally you'll have some sort of procedure that you want to follow maybe it's a handout you know, like the lab manual that your professor gives you, or maybe you're working in a research lab and there's a standard operating procedure. That's great, but also I know from experience that people do not always follow the procedure exactly as written. So be sure to write down what you actually did. And there are a couple of ways that you can do this. One is to actually write what you do as you do it, which is, the habit I got into a long time ago. I don't know if that's the ideal way to do it. So I, I will show you an alternative later on. Before you even get into lab, there are a few things you should do. First of all, you want to think about what this experiment is all about. You may or may not actually write this in your lab notebook. If you are working in a research lab, I think it's really important. I say this as someone who only does it about 50% of the time. There have been times when I've looked back at my research notebook and like, why did I do this experiment anyway? So it's, it's kind of nice to think about why you're doing what you're doing and just recording that in your notebook. You should have a plan for what to do. Again, as I said before, you may or may not have this in a notebook. If you have a standard operating procedure that everyone follows when they do this thing, this is something that I have my research students do is create these standard operating procedures. Great. Um, you may have that on a separate printout. It may be in your lab protocol and you need to know where that is. So you don't just go into lab without a plan. Also, if you need to do any calculations before you start, you should do those before you come to lab if possible. When you do those calculations, it's best if you put them in your notebook. For example, let's say that you're asked to calculate how much sodium chloride you need to add to a solution and you and your lab partner both do the calculations and you come into lab and you say, oh, well, we're going to start off by adding 1.2 grams of sodium chloride and your lab partner says, no, that's not what I got. I wrote down that we need 1.6 grams of sodium chloride. Well, how are you going to check who's right? If you want to double check your calculations and those calculations are on a piece of scratch paper back home, that's not very helpful. So best to do the calculations in your lab notebook. During the experiment, you're going to, first of all, make sure you get the date. Dates are very important, especially if you're working in an industrial setting, because, you know, that could be the difference between, did you discover this first? Can you patent it or not? Right. But also it is important to keep track of like what you do when. You're gonna write what you actually do. Again, I talked about this with the procedure and 
what the results are. And a lot of times those things will go hand in hand. That last statement is very vague. I just want to say that how you record, what you did, and what the results actually were is up to you. And I'm going to show you a series of pages from lab notebooks and you can see that there are different styles. So one of the things you could do that a lot of students like is to use a double column layout. And so what you have on the left side here is you have the procedure and on the right side you have your observations and results. And if you choose to set it up this way, what you'll do is you'll go in beforehand and this is where you're going to make your plan for what you're going to do for your experiment. So for example, here's a few steps from an experiment you might do later on. Start with 100 mils of water to a 400 mil beaker, add one gram of sodium chloride, add five mils of nitric acid, and then add 50 mils of one molar so silver nitrate and stir the solution with a stir rod. Okay, so let's say that's what you put in your lab notebook before you get into lab, and then as you do this, you're gonna write stuff down. The procedure says, add 100 mils of water to a 400 mil beaker. The observation that's here is that you used a grad cylinder to measure, but you couldn't get it exactly to 100.00 milliliters. So this note says very close to 100 mils, but not exact. Why would you write something like this? Well, maybe it matters how much water you use. And so you are, in some ways deviating from what the procedure says. And so you're explaining, this is how I deviated from the procedure. Okay, add 1.0 grams of sodium chloride. Now, if you've ever tried to weigh out an exact amount on a balance, it's almost impossible to get it to exactly one gram, right? So the actual mass of the sodium chloride gets recorded here, 0.997 grams. Okay, step three, add five mils of HNO3. In this case, this person did not measure very precisely, and they just said, oh, I estimated how much I put in, might have been more like four mils. So in other words, you, you might have put in a little less than you, you ought to have. This might affect your results down the line. When you go through and you analyze your data, you might say, gosh, I wonder why I didn't get as much as I needed. Oh, maybe I didn't add enough nitric acid. Step four said add 50 mils of one molar silver nitrate and the first observation here is the bottle said silver nitrate was 0.875 molar. This is kind of like what we did with the mass of sodium chloride, where in this case, the person who's doing the experiment couldn't weigh out exactly one gram. Well, sometimes when we're setting up a lab, we're like, oh, we need something with this concentration. And you look in the stock room and there's a bottle with a different concentration. Okay. so you write down, well, this, it wasn't actually one molar silver nitrate. It was 0.875 molar. Oh, and then they stirred the solution. And after they added the silver nitrate, they formed a yellow precipitate, a color change, a precipitate forming. Those are both observations that count as data. So that gives you an idea of how you can, how you can lay it out. It is not the only way. When I'm looking at someone's lab notebook, which I will do at the end of every quarter that I have students in my class, there are a few things I'm going to look at. First of all, is it written in pen? Some people hate writing in pen. Too bad. Um, lab notebooks should be written in pen. I do recommend that you choose a pen that does not have water soluble ink. As much as I love gel pens, they're really horrible for lab notebooks because you will spill things on your lab notebooks. And if you have water soluble pens, then that kind of messes with your record. Is each entry dated? Do I understand what was done in an experiment? The second question here, I think, helps me evaluate how well I understand what was done. If I wanted to redo your experiment exactly as you did it, if I tried to replicate it, could I do it? Or would I be missing things the way that I was missing information from, you know, Andy's notebook? And then also, does the notebook contain all of the data necessary for understanding the results? Does it have all the numbers, AKA all the measurements? Does it have all the non-numerical observations? That sort of thing. Okay, so these, these are what I look for. One of the most important reasons I evaluate people's notebooks and write something about that in their actual evaluation is that when people use me as a reference for jobs and employers call me, they will ask about 
a person's lab notebook. This is how I wish my lab notebooks looked. Um, this was done by my very first research student who had great handwriting, could draw a lot better than me, um, and you can see also she had developed good habits. She always signed and dated her lab notebooks. This one is from a former student, very clearly labeled uh, date. Um, they also put lab partners in the upper corner. I had to like cut the lab partners names out because they also put the lab partners email addresses so they could contact the lab partners to coordinate their group lab report. So you can see they've got a goal, they've got a set of materials, here are the observations, and of course these nice diagrams as to how they generated the gas in this experiment. This one is from a student who liked to do the double column setup. Planned procedure on the left side, they have the observation on the right side. One thing I really like about this particular page is that this was a two week lab and the student stopped at the end of this first week and said, stopping point next time and wrote notes about what are the things I need to think about for the second part of this experiment? What will we test? How will we test all the number one criteria? How to evaluate slash report test results for number two? And then there's a few notes on, you know, these are the things that we thought we will test. So I really like having that, you know, here are the things that I thought of while I was in the lab of how I want to analyze my data, how I want to test results in the future. So in summary, what we're trying to do is we're trying to instill good habits in you. And the habits are, how do you learn to keep a thorough lab notebook that contains everything that you want to help you write a good scientific report? I hope this was helpful and I look forward to helping you out with this in lab.